Well, it is a joy for the men of this church who were so richly fed this weekend at our meds conference to share Pastor Brian Farrell with the rest of you. Brian Farrell is a senior pastor at Timberlake Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's joined here this weekend by his son, Jared. Uh, Tracy, his wife, and his other kids uh, are home at Virginia, so they have been so kind to share Brian and Jared with us this weekend. Brian not only pastors the church there, he is also a professor for the Expositor Seminary. He is a professor of church history. He is a professor of the geography of Israel, a professor in pastoral theology. Uh, our men here going through the seminary have had and will have more of uh, Dr. Brian Farrell. We're so excited to have him here this weekend. And I know that after this weekend, you will be sermon stalking him. Uh, which is just a little bit creepy, but uh, very appropriate. And so, um, really thrilled to have you. Brian is a, a faithful shepherd in his church, um, but he is also, to use his own words against him here, a foxhole brother. Uh, the kind of guy you want in the trenches with you, fighting for the truth, laboring for the glory of Christ and for the building up of his church. Brian Farrell is my friend, and I'm so glad to have you come preach the word to our church. Well, good morning. It's good to see you today. Uh, hear introductions about myself, and must have this outer body experience thinking, who is that guy talking about? Because that doesn't feel like me. Uh, I didn't come to Jesus until I was 24 and um, didn't know the difference between the Old and New Testament and just was a pagan to my shame, saved by the grace of Christ, was running as hard and as fast as I could in the opposite direction, and, uh, and God sought me and bought me and uh, then put me to do His work. In, in, in high school and college, I was petrified to speak in front of people. I kid you not, I would rather write a 12-page paper. And writing a 12-page paper as a high schooler well, is hard. I'd rather do that than give a two-minute speech, just fear of man. And so God has a sense of humor uh, putting you, but, but he, he just he gives you the ability to do what he, what he calls you um, to do. And I uh, bring you greetings on behalf of the brothers and sisters at, uh, at Timberlake, um, we pray for you. We thank God for you. You're part of a network that we're part of, and we consider you a sister church, even though you don't know me and know the folks that, uh, that are there. And our folks don't know you. We, 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 we know what you stand for, and we know what you're about, and uh, that's the same thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to go all over the U.S. and, and just know exactly. I, again, I don't know you, but I know you. I know what you believe, and I know what you've been taught. And it's just like plug and play. It uh, it really is. It's a it's it's a wonderful thing. And we love your pastors uh, as as well. As I considered what to preach um, uh, as a guest, um, one man told me a long time ago. You know, being asked to preach at at another church is is, is sort of like being asked to dance with another man's wife, which you want to do that very carefully. Um, and um, so I, I, I try to follow the same rules that I give to the guys that, that are back at Timberlake. Um, you know, I, I say, get, if you preach at church when I'm gone, get the text right and don't create any messes that I have to clean up on, you know, on Monday. And some usually happens with the younger guys. Um, they use their chance in the pulpit to uh, to correct everything that you know that that they think is wrong, or to preach that doctrine that they don't think the pastor is strong enough on, and and then that usually creates a Monday mess, which means emails and a lot of counseling and, and those kinds of things. I will not do that this morning, brother. At least I'll try not to. Um, I, I, I do want to deeply, uh, uh, I, I deeply want to serve uh, the Lord by uh you know by, by serving you and and share something with you that will encourage you in your faith and i think the passage that we have in front of us uh will and so with all of that my mind immediately went to the apostle paul um the life of paul we just did the life of john rogers and so my mind probably went to the life of paul after that an example of paul i mean outside of 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 christ I don't believe there's any greater example of a faithful Christian than Paul. There are plenty of other examples, but 
but Paul is, is clearly up there. I mean, uh, there's no one who had a better grasp on a life uh, well lived for the gospel than, than Paul. I mean, once God laid hold of Paul's heart, he, he gave his entire existence for the salvation and sanctification of God's sheep. I mean, that's just that's all Paul was, was about. And you know, even in the book that we'll go to, is that, that famous verse, to live is Christ. And, um, and living uh, as Christ meant to give his life for the salvation and the sanctification of, of God's, God's sheep, which is why he focused in his entire ministry on planting churches and strengthening them. Plant church, strengthen the church. And um, he preached the gospel in unplowed places to gather God's people. He, he labored to grow them once they were gathered together. He visited them. He prayed for them. He wrote to them. And one of those letters to the church at Philippi contains a synopsis of Paul's pastoral purpose. Um, it houses one of the the, uh, one of his favorite metaphors that describes how he viewed himself and his work. Um, as I mentioned, listening to how that statement was described of, of, of who I am, um, there's a way I view myself. Uh, and here's the way that Paul viewed his self, uh, himself in, 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 in his work. I mean, he presents it uh, as something we should imitate as well. Um, it's scripture and it's found in Philippians 2 so open your Bibles to the book of Philippians this morning and the section that we're in begins in uh, chapter 1 verse 27 we're going to be in chapter 2 verses 17 through, through 18 and Paul's letter actually has nine parts and our verse is found in his section on Christ-like exhortation. So you have Paul's gracious greeting, his thankful prayer, the description of his challenging circumstances, and then Christ-like exhortations, and then false Paul's faithful companions. And um, really verses 17 and 18 are a bridge between that section 4 and 5 that you see up there on the, on the screen. And um, it's a bridge to, to Paul's faithful companions, which we read this morning, which was Timothy and Epaphroditus. And so you have Paul, you have Christ, and then you have Paul, and then you have Timothy, and then you have Epaphroditus. And the entire section follows a passage I'm sure you know well, which is Christ's ultimate example of humility in verses 6 through, through 11. And Paul's application of that example uh, in in two areas, follows, follows that. And you, you know that as well, where Jesus was, was his humility. Um, then you also know some verses that follow where Paul begins to apply that. You know, Christ condescended, and because of that, God highly exalted him. And then uh, that, the application of Christ's example comes in pursuing holiness because God's holy, and then don't grumble and, uh, or complain as you pursue it, which is where we started in verse 14 this morning. Verse 5, though, of Philippians 2 is the headwaters of, of the river, and everything flows downstream from that. So look at verse 5, if you will, of Philippians 2. Again, you know this verse. Let this mind or attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus... There's the, the headwaters of the river. And then the current cascades the water over the dam in verses 6 through 11. Verse 6, Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And look at verse 9. For this reason... Christ condescended, he came to us. God didn't call us to come up to him. God came to us because we were unable. And for this reason, in verse 9, God, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. I mean, Christ's humble obedience on the cross led to God exalting him as Lord over all creation. But after that example, then Paul appeals to us as Christ's followers to pursue holiness by Working out our salvation in fear and trembling, because it's God who is at work in you. It's verses 12 and 13. And then he gives specific instructions of how to do that in verses 14 through, 
through 16. You do that without grumbling or, or, or complaining. And he says both of those will be a witness to a corrupt world. That's part of the passage that we read this morning. But now even further downstream from that, Paul is going to show us, he's going to illustrate for us what, what that kind of, of life looks like. A life that's actually applying this, this, this model of Christ, the humility of Christ, the condescension, the pouring out his life for, for others. And Paul makes application of Christ's humble obedience, and, and he gives us models to illustrate that. Three models to be exact. I mean, so you have a theology lesson in the example of Christ in verses 6 through 11, then a general application in verses 12 and 13, work out your own salvation, then a specific application in verses 14 and 16, do it without grumbling or complaining. And now Paul gives three object lessons to help us see how that's, how that's lived out. These are living lessons observed in the Apostle Paul's sacrifice, in Timothy's selflessness, and then in Epaphroditus' service. So he focuses on himself, and then on he's going to send Timothy, and he says some things about Timothy, and then he says, receive Epaphroditus whenever he comes, because he, there's some things I want to point out about his life as well, as, a, as an example to you. And I mean, we all like examples, uh, when it comes to teaching, right? I mean, so Paul doesn't leave us hanging. And we've already been given the example of Christ. He's the ultimate example. That's the original. I mean, and, and we know what he did. But so you're not tempted to think, well, that was Jesus. Um, I mean, he was God in the flesh. I, I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm not sure I can do what he did. He follows up with three representations of, of three ordinary believers who actually image what, what's pictured here in Christ. I mean, we all know Jesus was humble, but how do his followers live out his example? Rubber meets the road, shoe leather type of, of, of things. I mean, what does it look like for his followers to imitate him? That's what we desire to do. We desire to do a lot of things, but, but then we say, okay, how do I specifically do that? I, how do I put that into... In, in, into practice. I mean, what does it look like when a man has the attitude of Christ in him or a woman has the attitude of Christ in him? Well, Paul shows us here. And these are personal examples of biblical truth and action, and they, they flesh out different aspects of obedient humility, and they're models for us to follow when you put all three of these men together. And while we may question if we can imitate Jesus as the sinless Son of God, when we we see another believer successfully living out God's word, we gain encouragement. And that's Paul's purpose. And, and by the way, the, these helpful brothers come from all walks of life. I mean, Paul was an apostle. Timothy was a young pastor and still in training. Paul's still writing to him, and you'll do that in, around the same time. And Epaphroditus is, uh, is just a regular church member. Just so we don't say that this level of service is only for those in ministry. It's only for the apostles and only for the pastors. I mean, these three, these three men who displayed Christ-like character to the Philippians are, are people that we can relate to, and we are to follow them as they followed Christ. That, that's Paul's goal. And he starts with his own example. We're only going to look at Paul this morning for... For time's sake, but he describes an, an illustration of a faithful life. But I would encourage you to, to go on and look at Timothy and see what Paul says about Timothy and what he says about Epaphroditus and put all three of them together, and you'll get a, a practical model of what it looks like for a Christian to, to live out this humility of Christ. And Paul imitates two components of Christ's joyful sacrifice here. He, Verse 17, which I'm only going to look at two verses. In verse 17, it's, the first is his description of sacrificial service. And the second is his delight in sacrificial serving. His description of sacrificial service and his delight in sacrificial serving. Let's look at the, the first one. It's found in verse 17. The first description of, uh, is... Uh, is of Paul's sacrificial service. And Paul says, imitation of Christ, joyful sacrifice is poured out and it's poured upon others. It's, it's poured out and it's poured upon others. Look at verse 17. And you can see this very plainly in the, in, in the text. Verse 17. 
Paul says, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. So Paul talks about being poured out, and he talks about being poured on their faith. Paul says he lived a, a poured out life for, for others, and he's basically saying, so should you, so should I. He starts by describing what that kind of life looks like. And now all three of these men are together in, in Rome, so it's easy, as Paul is writing, to think about the, these, these characteristics that he wants to highlight his own life and, and, and these two, two other men that he wants you to pattern. I mean, it's fresh in his mind. I mean, Paul was in prison. Timothy was with Paul serving him. And Epaphroditus had come from Philippi to, to bring money and minister to Paul as, as he stayed there. And he just mentioned the, the day of Christ when, 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 when we'll face a, a judgment. And uh, that's probably got Paul thinking about what awaited him in his earthly trial with Nero. And so he starts to think what that will mean for him. I mean, if I actually die right now, I mean, we know we're all going to die, but, but we, we, we think that it'll be tomorrow. And so we, we, we don't always have the gift, and it's a gift to be brought, brought to the reality or made aware that it could happen like now. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen next week. And then between right now and when that happens is all the time I've got left. And so Paul's thinking about, uh, thinking about that. And as he starts to think about what that will mean for them, uh, mean for him and, and them, at the end of his trial, he'll be set free to return to minister to them, or he'll be killed for his faith in, in Christ. And regardless of the outcome, live or die, that outcome, like his entire life, in Paul's mind, was a sacrificial offering for them. Live or die. I want you to notice, Paul is not talking about his, his death only here, though. Look at what he says in verse 17. He says, I am being poured out. And he uses a, a, a similar metaphor that you probably know, that you probably hear it at memorial services. A similar metaphor about being poured out in 2 Timothy 4, where he says the same thing. And there he adds the reference of death, the focus of death. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So he, he mentions the death part there. So his offering would be complete, this offering that's happening, it's ongoing. It's going to, be deplete, uh, going to be complete when his departure or when his death comes. So whatever Paul is talking about here with this, with this metaphor, it's something current, it's happening right now, and it's something ongoing, and it's going to be something complete whenever he, he leaves earth. And he's already said in chapter 1 that he believes that he's actually going to be released from prison. And he intends to come to the church very shortly to really grasp the example that Paul intends there, you, you, you have to understand the sacrificial system that he's describing. And when you do, the illustration comes to life, pun intended. I mean, the verb poured out is a very technical word, specifically related to a certain part of the priestly system, sacrificial system, in both Jewish and pagan practices, a person performing a sacrifice would first kill an animal and then they would offer it by placing it on a burnt altar. And you're probably very familiar with that part from the, from the Old Testament. But beyond that, there was a secondary offering, uh, both called a drink offering and a libation uh, that would be added to the main offering. And after placing their burnt sacrifice on the altar, if the worshiper really wanted to express even greater worship or greater honor, they would pour a cup of wine or oil on top of their burnt offering, and that was a drink offering. And he didn't replace the main offering, but it was poured over top of the meat to complement it. And the purpose of the drink offering was to commend, was to make more glorious the primary one. Now, Look at what he says about his relationship, about this relationship to his ministry uh, to the Philippian believers in, in verse 17. 
Paul says his ministry was poured out and it was poured upon. And he uses this, this, this technical word. It's his sacrifice is being poured upon the sacrifice and service of their faith. To see a, a sacrifice uh, and their public service. Their offering to God and the outward works or activities that came from it. So when you put it together, the Philippians are pictured here as an animal strapped to the altar. And Paul says his labor is like the drink offering. It's poured on top of theirs to add to it. I mean, their faithful lives were the main offering that was being consumed, their faith that had been lived out. And then Paul comes along and he adds his life to theirs and together they're, they're offered to God. And he's already described what their sacrifice and service looks like. If you, if you know the letter or read the letter, it was their faith that he thanked God for in verse 6. It was their monetary gift that they sent Paul to sustain him in prison in verse 5. It was their unified lives inside the church that were worthy of the gospel in verse 27, striving together with one heart and one mind and one soul. It was their unflinching testimony outside that was a sign outside of the church that was a sign of their salvation and their opponent's destruction in verse 28. It was their humble attitude and obedience of Christ and to Christ, faith and giving and unity and holy living and humble obedience. That was their offering. That was their faith. That was what was being lived out. And all of that sacrifice and priestly service as, as part of their Christian faith is the same for you. Faith and giving and unity and holy living and humble obedience. That's what it looks like to live as, a, as an everyday Christian. And, and that's complemented and completed, Paul says, by his own sacrificial service. Or the service of others, for that matter. It doesn't have to be the pastor. And Paul says his ongoing ministry on behalf of the church is to assist theirs. I mean, Romans 12, I know you know, or assume you know, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Unless you're new to the faith, like I was. Where Paul urges there, by the mercies of God, or because of the mercies of God, in light of the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a, as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. It's your spiritual service of worship. You're presenting all that you are to God. Uh, the idea of putting your, yourself on the altar, not as a dead animal, but a living person. I, I'm, my life is yours, Lord. And Paul says his life was to magnify that. And he says, so should your life be to magnify that, other people's living sacrifices. You and I are either offering ourselves to God or we're helping others in their offering. That's how you live out the humble example of, of Christ. I mean, we live by faith, meaning we believe God not the world around us. We give and we help the gospel go forth. We protect the unity in the church by keeping the gospel the main thing. We walk worthy and we don't live in unrepentant sin and shame the Lord's name. We humbly obey and we, we don't grumble as we do. And together we pour out our lives on others to help them do the same thing. Christianity is a, is a participation sport. Now, what do you think happened... When a burnt offering was on fire, and the wine and the oil, which was a mixture of alcohol and oil, was poured over that. What do you think happened? Well, you probably know. It dripped down over the meat, and it flamed up in a glorious display because the altar was hot. And then the drink offering immediately disappeared in a puff of, of steam. And Paul says his, he sees his pastoral services the same way, his service as a Christian, is the, the same way. Paul says, my life's not the main course, it's secondary. It has a purpose of making someone else's offering, their offering, more glorious to Christ. You offer your life as a living sacrifice to the Lord, and then your elders come along and equip you to complement that sacrifice and to complement your sacrifice. 
then their lives will happily disappear like a puff of steam on the flames of God's altar. That's how they really feel about you. How do I know that? Because that's how I feel about the people at Timberlake. And it's a beautiful display before, before the Lord. And how's that for an example of a humble attitude? Is that what you think about your service to others? It's to make their faith look more glorious. And as you do, then I just want to evaporate like steam. One writer said, Paul says his work was like the museum light placed on the Mona Lisa. It wasn't the painting, but it was something that highlighted it. It's not, drawn, it's not to draw attention to the bright fire, but to draw attention to the sacrifice. The fire and, and everything was there was to focus on the sacrifice. Paul calls that a poured out life. And he calls us to live the same kind of, of lives. And that's the purpose of our personal ministry to others, to complement what someone else is offering to God. And they offer a sacrifice of of faith, and we come along and pour our offering to the Lord on top of theirs, and together that creates a more glorious sacrifice to Christ. That's what Ephesians 4 says, right? Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head and into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up other in builds itself up in in, in love. And in seeing those kinds of examples, seeing others flame up the offering to, to, to make more glorious the faith of others, actually seeing people do that actually motivates me and motivates you to do the same thing. That's what Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 is is all about. It says when we gather together, we we do this collectively. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good works. How do we stimulate one another to good works? When you come to church, your your, your goal is not what what I get. You're getting plenty when you get here. You get the Word of God. God speaks and... You're getting encouragement, but, but when we all gather together, we're stimulating each other, and our goal is to, is to do that for other people, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of, of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day draw near. I mean, when we gather together, our primary and secondary sacrifices encourage each other to excel all the more. And again, think about the sacrificial illustration again i mean if you're standing in line waiting to put your sacrifice on the the altar and you're in a line say it's a long line you can't see what what's going on you you went to the temple you couldn't actually see what the priests were doing you can't see the hunk of meat on 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 the altar that other people are, are offering you can't see the main offering but you could see the flash a fire that came up from the drink offerings, and you can see the smoke rising. I can remember going to Israel and one of the first few times and somebody describing what, what Jerusalem probably smelled like, this glorious perpetual barbecue. You know what it smells like when your neighbor is cooking burgers and you're really hungry? I mean, it smelled wonderful. And you get that flash and the smoke that's firing up, and what does that do? Like, I can't wait to get there to put mine on the altar. Can't wait to get to the front of the line and make yours. And Paul says, that's the goal of my life. It's to magnify the sacrifices of others and to complement the service of my brothers and, and sisters. It's to make them look more glorious and to draw attention to their faith, not my own, and, and to be an example for others to do the same. Is that the goal of your Christian life? That's what it means to live for others. That's what it means to imitate Christ. He came to serve, not to be served. He came to pour out his life. It's not, it's not a bumper sticker, love God and, and, and love others. And loving others is not some feeling-based sentimental association with somebody's, fa- uh, somebody's pain. It's to add your effort to theirs in the fight of faith. It's to evangelize them like Paul, uh, like, like Paul did Lydia. It's, it's to spend time discipling them like Paul did the Philippian church just to pray for them and with them like he did. It's to attend church with them and long to return when, when you can. It's to rejoice with them. 
It's to give so that they, along with you, can, can be fed. And, and you say, I want to do that. And I'm listening to that, and you say, yeah, that, that, that's something I want to do. I mean, it's, that's the Spirit of God working through, through His Word. But, but I don't know where to start. Well, just look at the Apostle Paul's life, and, and you can find out. Remember, Paul didn't start as a sacrificing apostle, did he? There was this name Saul before you learned the man's name Paul. And I think there are two fundamental aspects of Paul's life that, that show us where to start. Like, I want to be like this. I, I want to live this way. Where do I start? I think you look at Paul's life. And there are two fundamental aspects about it that, that, that can help you do that. Number one, Paul forsook his old life. And number two, Paul gave away his new life. He forsook his old life, and he gave away his new one. I mean, before Paul ever became the great apostle, the first thing he did was he reckoned his old life as nothing. T turn over to Philippians 3. Let me show you this really, really quickly. How did Paul get here? How do I get here? Well, you, you reckon your old life as, as nothing. You, you turn loose of it. You see it for what it what it truly was. Verse 13, Philippians 3.13. Paul says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. My friend and some of yours, Joel James, said what he found most intriguing about what Paul says in verses 17 and 18 the passage we're looking at is that Paul was not born to do that. He was not born to serve, but to be served. I mean, you remember Paul's conversion, right? I mean, he's part of the Jewish elite. I mean, he was Saul. He was a rising star in Judaism, and so even volunteered to persecute Christians. He asked for the opportunity to do that, and they gave it to him. They're just not going to give that to anybody. And he did that so believers could be eradicated and there's ever a man with a pedigree for prominence it was it was Saul I mean he was born with a silver mezuzah in his mouth he he had the birthright we get Philippians 3 4 and 5 look just a few verses uh, up he says if if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh I have more circumcised of the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. And he also had a zealous approach. Verse 5, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And he had elite training. Paul said of himself in Acts 22, uh, 20, uh, 33, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as you all today. Paul even had Roman citizenship, which was a big deal. Significant privilege that not every Jew had. Um, it brought recognition even in the non-Jewish world. And you remember Paul when he planted the Philippian church in, in Acts 16. He cast the demon out of the, the slave girl there and wrecks the guy's business and a riot starts because of it and the Gentile authorities imprison him. And when they do, they violate his Roman rights. Acts 16, Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without a trial, men who are Romans. And they've thrown us into prison. And now they are sending us away secretly. No, indeed. <laughs> But let them come themselves and bring us out. And the policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates, and they were afraid. I mean, Paul had the ability to make the authorities afraid. I mean, he had that kind of, of pedigree. They were, came appealing to him. They kept begging him to leave the city. I mean, most people didn't have those kinds of rights. But look at what Paul says about all those privileges now that he's come to Christ in Philippians 3, 7. I'm sure you know it. Paul says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For His sake, 
I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. That's how Paul views his old life and his new one. That by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to stand before him one day. And I want to live a life this way before I do. Not the old way. If you want to model Paul, the first thing that you have to do, the first place it starts is to die to your rights. You have to forsake the privileges that you trust in, that you, you, you lean on, even your own life. You'll never put your hands to God's plow if there's something else in your hands. You'll never delight in God if your eyes are captured in something else. You can't serve two masters. And listen, I understand that's a painful process. It's not just saying, okay, I'm going to do that. The Lord will be faithful and take you through that. And I can, the Lord still takes me through that, reminds me of that, brings me back, and closes that integrity gap that we talked about earlier. But if you yield to Him, you will. You will. You won't start serving in a new ministry if you're too busy serving yourself or serving, trying to get. You, you won't start seminary because you have a full schedule elsewhere. You won't sacrifice because you, you have too much to lose. And Paul says, forsake the old and you will gain Christ and have no more concerns about losing it. You, you can't lose anything that you've already given away, right? And God may choose to give it all back to you. And if he does, it will come back purified in his holy fire but not because you brought it to the party, but because the Lord restored it. So pouring out your life first means forsaking it, but also means living, uh, living a new one for others. And so once Paul turned from his old life, Paul's new mission was to serve the faith of others. You remember what he said in Philippians 1, describing his new life? We mentioned it earlier. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's... The point of Paul's life. What's the point of this life that he calls Christ in verse 22? If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your account. Again, why he's living. His new life, his old one, no rights. It's gone. New life others to flame up their their sacrifice their faith and now notice how he puts both concepts to, together his life was not his own he says to live as christ he goes on living now it's for their benefit and over and over in this letter paul says his life mattered because it was spent for others and he does that in other letters too second corinthians 12 14 i will not be a burden to you for i do not seek what is yours but you <laughs> i seek you for you, you for children are not responsible to save up for their parents but parents for their children i will most gladly spend and be spent or be expended for your souls i'll gladly do that can you say that if I go on living, it will be for the benefit of others. That's why I want to keep on living. Not because I fear death or not because I want to stop or because I want to lose whatever it is or because I've never been to heaven. But because I'm going to lose the runway. I, I want more runway. I, I want more flight time to be able to, to live for others. To... Or if the truth be told, is it more like if you go on living, it would mean others will, will live to serve you. Lord, I live, it, live for the benefit of others. I, I exist to help the little ones grow in Jesus. I am, I'm alive to present my wife to Christ as a blameless woman. I, I, I live to be a helper uh, to my husband. I, I live to disciple. I live to share the gospel. Or do you live for reasons that will perish like dry grass on a burn pile? You won't be burned up if you're a believer. But your works will be. What 1 Corinthians 3 says. And Paul says his life was the oil and wine poured over other believers' service and sacrifice. He was a complement, not the main source. 
Again, a match exists to burn, not as the fire itself, but, but to ignite it. So Paul existed, our friend Dr. James. And not only does your service compound when it's, it's added to that of other believers, but your joy compounds as well. Here's the second component of, of joyful sacrifice. It's found in the delight in serving. There's a description of sacrificial service, and then there's the delight that Paul describes here in, in serving. He says that the delight is combined, and it's contagious. Look at the end of verse 17 and, and verse 18. Paul says, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. I share my joy with you, you share your joy with me. I mean, the second component to joyful sacrifice is to delight in it. That's just as vital as the first. I mean, the first component is, sacri- is the sacrifice itself. The second is the joy that you get from it. And I'm emphasizing the second part is just as important as the first. I mean, uh, it, it's the same word that Jesus used for the man who was rejoicing over his lost sheep. It's an intensified form of joy. And it's significant to note the description of Paul's service is, is the short part of this verse. I mean, if you look at verse 17 and 18, the, 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 the short part's what I just described. That's not even the main point. This is the longer part. I mean, Paul's circumstances of his sacrificial service is, is he's boying, being poured out as a drink offering, and, and those are the circumstances that he rejoices in. And that's not something that you would think about delighting in, is it? I delight to disappear like a puff of steam. I delight to take last place. I delight to, to make everyone else look, look glorious. I mean, and my point is, Paul is not, is not calling you as a Christian here to cold and calculated service, but joyful service. And you can't manufacture that joy. You've got to do what I said about throwing away your old life and your old rights and, and, and seeing what living actually is. Then joy comes from that. Joy is a byproduct of those two things. If, if, if you're still holding on to your old life and, and, and you don't know and you're not fully, fully committed, if you want to use that word, to, to the new life, then, then your spiritual cli- uh, pipes are going to be clogged. You need some, you need some Drano. Well, those things are combined, though. That, that's what makes it Christian, service and joy. That's what makes it Christian. P.T. O'Brien said, this is not just a call to serve, it, it's a call to Christian serving. I mean, anyone can serve. But what, it makes, what, what makes it Christian is it's for Christ and it's with joy. That's what makes it Christian. I mean, many religions around the world call for sacrifice and service. Literal or symbolic, you must give something of value to God as an offering. You lose something valuable to show God how serious you are, and the more dour and less enjoyable it is, the more spiritual it seems, right? That's what the Pharisees were doing. Oh, I'm fasting. I haven't eaten in a really long time, but I'm serving God doing it. I mean, some people live their Christian lives that way. Some people think that that's spiritual. It makes them look spiritual. Makes them, if it makes them feel bad, then it must be spiritual. And if it makes them feel, feel good, then it couldn't be godly. That, that's really the mentality of some people's Christian lives. I mean, there's an old country preacher where I'm from that said he asked one morning a lady that, that came in, said she always looked like that she'd been sucking on a prune before she came into the service. And she said, I always feel bad when I feel good because I know I'm going to feel worse. You met people like that? Even when I feel good, I, I feel bad because I know I'm going to feel worse one day. Some people live their Christian lives that way. Some people try to serve that way. But the unique aspect of Christianity is sacrifice mingled with joy. I mean, does it make any sense that you find joy of giving your life away? Does it make any sense that you find joy in giving money or living for somebody else or giving somebody? That doesn't make any sense, giving somebody else the limelight. Not from a human standpoint. Jesus adds an adjective to your activity. What is fundamentally different about what Paul calls for here is it's offered from a truly happy heart. It becomes 
Christian serving when you do it for Christ and you do it with joy. It becomes Christian when you put the heart desire with it. I mean, the, the Bible says in Psalm 100, verse 2, you don't just serve, you serve the Lord with gladness. You don't just give, you're a cheerful giver. You don't just suffer loss, you do it with joy. You don't just sacrifice, you do it and rejoice. Listen to how Paul describes the Christian paradox in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 9. He says, An unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. And as an unbeliever, I didn't understand that at all. In fact, I was looking at Christians and, and I was saying... I don't know if I want to be that because then I have to give up everything that I enjoy. I mean, Paul's not calling here for more bricks and less straw. He's calling you to make bricks while you're whistling a gospel tune in your heart. I mean, don't hear this message as you need to sacrifice more. Hear that if I'm sacrificing and I, I, I trudge through it all the time, there's a deeper problem. You say, how can that be? How can on one hand I give up something and then on the other hand be happy about it? Well, Paul's already answered that for us. Because a believer has already given himself away and in trade you gained God. I mean, have you ever thought about how raw of a deal God gets? You get Jesus and he gets you. That's a pretty bad deal, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the inheritance that Christ gets for his suffering and bearing the wrath on the cross is us. That's his glory in heaven. All of us around him. You give yourself away and you gain God. You die in order to live. And the life that you now live is a life that you were meant to live. And it's a life that makes no sense to the human mind or the earthly mind. But it is the mind of Christ. You remember a brother telling his father that he was leaving work to go into ministry and his dad said, have you lost your mind? And he said, yes, and I found the mind of Christ. <laughs> a believer's greatest joy is to give their new lives away. I find no greater joy than serving others. And again, I can remember listening as an unsaved man to Christians say that and explain what it was like to live for Jesus. And I'd say, I don't want to give up the things that I, that I enjoy. And I, I never, was never under the delusion that I could keep both worlds. I was never under the delusion that I could keep my sin and have my Savior or have a Savior. I, I knew I must forsake one for the other, and I didn't want to give up my sin. But when I came to Christ, I totally understood what they meant. And if you're a believer here this morning, you totally understand what I'm saying and what Paul's saying. In Christ, you start living the way you were made, and there's no greater joy, and it doesn't really feel like a sacrifice. You gain way more than you lose. G. Walter Hansen said, A believer's greatest joy comes at the point of his greatest sacrifice. You hear that in Paul's words, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share in his sufferings, uh, becoming like him in his death, that... By any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. I mean, most people experience happiness or joy based on what the world offers. And when things are favorable or good, they're happy. And when they're not, they're not. But a believer finds satisfaction in the Father's will and his children's welfare. Because he, he no longer lives for his own interests and he no longer finds happiness there. MacArthur said, it's difficult for self-centered people to understand how missionaries can live for years under primitive, demanding, and offering often dangerous conditions and yet maintain their joy. And it's because they, like Paul, learned this secret. Self-sacrifice for Christ is a sacrifice only in the sense it's being offered to God. It's never a sacrifice in the sense of being a loss. You cannot give anything away to the Lord that's not replaced by something infinitely more valuable. I mean, God takes nothing from you as a, as a loss. He gives you what is truly valuable. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Jesus, Paul says, my Lord. Colossians, he says the same thing. 
124, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of the body, that is the church. And it wasn't just Paul. Peter says the, the same thing. 1 Peter 4.13, but, uh, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Rejoice as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. And he now invites the Philippians to share in the same joy. It's contagious and it's combined. Look at verse 18. You too, I urge, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. He says joy is contagious and joy can be shared. Uh, sacrificial service is contagious and so is joy. I rejoice and share my joy with you all. He now turns it around and says, you too. You say, what does that mean? Well, let me try to explain it. You probably, unfortunately, remember watching a modified sporting event during, during COVID. Uh, basketball with no fans, baseball with no fans, hockey with empty rinks. And it felt incomplete, didn't it? It's because it was. And no matter how hard they tried, the sports without fans never, never worked because it's a participatory event, isn't it? It's just like the enjoyment of the game. Part of it is sharing it with others and screaming and high-fiving. High and, and so one of the reasons we gather and one of the things that we've already done this morning and fellowship has the same dynamic. And Christ says when other Christians rejoice around you, it increases your joy as well. I mean, imagine if you would, uh, if you went to a football game and it was the fourth quarter with 20 seconds left on the clock and your team is fourth, uh, is, is four and, and three and your team scores a touchdown and they win the game and you had to just sit there on your hands and do and say nothing. Would that be fun? Wouldn't be fun. Oh, fun to be yelling and screaming with your friends that are there and you're participating with them. And we don't yell and scream here, but we do, we do share joy. And our joy feeds off of one another. I mean, think about it. When you hear of other believers sacrificing, I mean, really giving their life for Christ in the midst of that suffering, they're, and they're singing, doesn't that motivate you? You just heard an example of it. And what Smedley mentioned before I got up here. Does not fill you with, with overflowing joy? Of course it does, because serving becomes Christian when it's done for Christ and it's done with joy. And then you do it together. That's what the church is. You do that together. So you can't grudgingly serve because that's not cr true Christian service. And you can't serve without joy because it doesn't accomplish what God intends. And it's not beneficial for others or yourself if you do it alone. So let me ask you. To what extent do you find joy in highlighting the gifts, the faith, the service of others and their sacrifice? When they get credit for something that you help them do, is there something inside of you that says, hey, what about me? Or do you genuinely rejoice and not think about yourself? Why do we struggle to serve with joy? I think it's because we haven't connected point number one, which is to die to your own self. When I find sermon prep or serving hard or grinding what I'm thinking is something else is really what I desire to be doing right now. I'm thinking about myself. Because Paul and the Philippians had both served and sacrificed together, they were able to rejoice together. And so Paul imitates. He gives this example of two components of Christ's joyful sacrifice. The description of sacrificial service is it's a life poured out for God upon others. And there's delight in the sacrificial serving, and when it's combined, it's contagious. Is that the picture of your life? I'm sure it is. I've been here for a couple of days. I've seen it. I've seen the joy in you and the service of others. And if it's not, start with looking to Christ's example. Look at what he did for you. Um, and then trust in it. And die to your rights. Uh, and then live and find real life, true life, life that is meaningful life that when you do show up before God, you won't have, you won't have regrets, um, and you'll give thanks for it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
I do thank you for Paul's example here. I thank you for reteaching me these truths this morning. Help me to live a life that's poured out for others and poured upon. And help me to do it with joy and help everyone here to do the same. And I pray for anyone, Lord, who just doesn't understand. They still want to hold on to their, their sin. I pray that they would look to Christ, look away from themselves and look to Him and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.